On this Wednesday night, we're learning more about Toronto victims, the strangers who ran to help them, and the man accused of killing them. The heartbreaking story of a single mom and who she's left behind. And how good Samaritans sprang into action in those first frantic moments. And did misogyny in the dark corners of the internet lead to the horrible bloodshed? Also tonight, after the tragedy in Humboldt, we look into how truck drivers are trained in Canada. And an early morning plane landing that could have gone so wrong. We'll show you how this Calgary-bound flight managed an absolutely unscheduled touchdown. You'll definitely want to hear the story behind that one. This is The National. Two days after that mass killing in Toronto claimed 10 lives, we are hearing the names of more victims and their heartbreaking stories. And we're also learning about the broader impact of that van attack. In one way, it's exposing an online underworld mired in misogyny, a place where the accused killer may have found a community. But the attack is also building a community, one that's united by the noblest of human instincts. Ioana Ramiliotis begins our coverage there. It's here, in the sodden mound of flowers and tributes. This note, a simple, poignant reminder, they were not alone. The victims of Monday's attack had no connection to one another. It seems fitting that strangers keep offering solace. You always hear of it happening, you know, somewhere else, not right outside of where you work or where you live, so. The randomness of the attack, knowing that it could have been anyone here, has created communities of sorrow. This group works at a nearby government office. Not only we want to show our uh, uh, heartfelt and condolences about grieving families, we want to show the support that we care about them. A few minutes later, postal workers came together too. It's difficult. It really is very difficult because it didn't just affect those lives, but every single person that knew them and their extended families and, and friends. So it's very sad. The identities of the victims are trickling out. So are the outlines of their lives. Today, Renuka Amarasinghu, a single mother of a seven-year-old boy. Amarasinghu worked for the Toronto School Board. She had just finished her first day of work at this school. Her close friend is devastated, especially for the son she leaves behind. She always told me every time when I met her, my aim is, my only dream is, I want to live until my son finishes studies, finishes studies and stand his own feet. After, I am free to die. Because she's a single mom, she always dream about her child. Family friends are taking care of the boy. A GoFundMe campaign is underway to support his suddenly broken life. Another victim CBC News has confirmed, Sharm Min Gang a chef described by friends and colleagues as passionate and kind. He leaves behind a wife in South Korea. His last moments comforted by a stranger who wants to remain anonymous. I was holding onto his hand and I was, I was kind of, I was raising my voice a bit. I was just like, come on, like, ambulance are here. They're gonna come get you. Also among the dead, 94-year-old Betty Forsyth, who neighbors say loved to feed the birds on her regular walks. The diversity of the victims named so far speaks to the cities too. And while on this stretch, 10 separate, disparate lives ended, their deaths may leave a resilient connection behind. A neighborhood church a few steps away offers respite. Reverend Bruce Jones also offers hope. I think this could be the seminal moment when not only Willowdale, but Young and Finch becomes a special community that identifies itself, that people will proudly wear I'm from Young and Finch. The Reverend Ian is planning a special service this Sunday to honour the victims and to speak to that notion of shared sorrow. And you, Anna, let's talk about another angle on this story. Toronto Police giving an update today on Constable Ken Lamb, who, of course, arrested that suspect without firing a shot. Yes, in fact, they were talking about the fact that he's still very overwhelmed. He's still processing what happened, still deconstructing it frame by frame, and also thinking about how it could have unfolded very differently. Here's what the deputy um, police chief had to say about that. 
Well, when I say treatment, I, I don't want you to think that he's going to see a doctor, he's under medication or anything like that. There's mandatory protocol that we have to go through when you go through a traumatic experience. He has to see our, our service psychologist. He has to see our medical bureau. And he has, to, he has to disclose to us, he has to talk to psychologists. We want him to talk this out, talk it out, talk it out, talk it out, until, until we're comfortable at his state of mind that he's, he understand what took place. Because right now he's still asking me, asking his colleagues, did I make the right decision? What if I fire, opened fire that day? What would happen to me? These are things that's still been going through his mind. So, Joanna, we're hearing from people talking about Constable Lamb, but not directly from, from him, at least not yet. Not yet, Ian. You know, he's a key witness to this, so he can't say much publicly until after the trial, but police understand the public wants to hear from him, wants to hear him say something about what happened. So they do expect and they do hope that he will issue a brief statement or maybe even make an appearance in the coming days. It's just a question of when he's up to it. All right, that would be nice. You enter Emiliotis at the uh, scene of the vigil this evening. Thank you. Since Monday, donors have pledged more than $830,000 to campaigns raising funds in the name of the attack victims. The Toronto Foundation, an official partnership with the city, has raised just over half a million dollars. That includes some major corporate donations. There are also a number of campaigns on the GoFundMe site. Together, they've raised more than $300,000. Now, let's listen to a special constable from Toronto's transit service whose job took on huge new dimensions on Monday. My partner uh, got out of the car and tended to a female that was uh, seriously injured um, on the corner. I, think, I, I believe she might have been one of the first to be impacted by the van. And then there was the Toronto police had already arrived, arrived at the exact same time that I had arrived. One of the officers was doing CPR on, on, a, on a person. I asked him if he needed help. He said, move down. There's a whole bunch more. And there was a lot more. So one of the many first responders to Monday's attack. And like Constable Lamb, they have been praised for their professional conduct in the face of this sudden horror. But it wasn't just officials who stepped into the fray. Ordinary citizens looked past the chaos to answer the desperate need for help. And we tracked down some of those good Samaritans. Yeah, I was sitting in uh, the restaurant right behind us. We see a white van speeding on the sidewalk and we ran to the, uh, to the fellow who was down on the ground. She could tell that he had been dragged, possibly under the van. All of his clothes were ripped. We had to make a decision whether we were going to untwist him, and we decided not to, that it could cause more injury. And so I went into the middle of the street and uh, directed the, uh, the fire truck then we converged and uh, the firemen immediately were, you know, assisting him, putting him straight, uh, and they were going to take care of him. I came here waiting for the red light. Then I heard something like smash and the van that ran in and people, they are flying in the sky. And they saw one lady. Oh, my God, it was his heart breaking. You know, it's uh, her legs. They are smashed. They are really smudge. And then I saw another lady, she was lying there. And then I jumped, because that one, that lady, the first lady, she was bleeding so so badly. And there were another, another two guys there. So the, the guy, he was yelling, belt, belt, belt. So I give him my belt. And we tried to help her, like, to stop the bleeding. But at the same time, he, the, other, the other lady, she was, like, suffering. So I had to go and check on her. Uh, but she was alive, she was alive, but she was so hurt, hurt on her back, on her legs and stuff, and I tried to comfort her. I was just talking to her. I told her, where, where do you feel the pain? Don't move. I tried to do, like, the first aid. It's heartbreaking, you know what? And I was coming out of the driveway, and there was this van coming in the sidewalk. Like, the lady was going north, and when the lady saw the van coming at that speed, she was trying to step aside to let the van go through, but she was not lucky. She got pinned in the sh uh, bad shelter. And so I lifted her up a little bit and another guy pulled in front of me and he came, he also came to help. And we were taking the bro bro broken glass off her skin. There was the fire truck that was coming and I ran into the street 
to stop them. That there's a victim here, and they stopped and they came and uh, they took over from us. I would have feel guilty if I didn't uh, go there and, and 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 try to help. So you know, it's it's something that I would do again if I see it. Boy, I, uh, hopefully, Rosemary, we never are in that situation. Yeah. But uh, I'd like to think that uh, all of us would respond. In that sort of way, let's turn our focus, though, now to uh, what we're learning about the suspect and the world that he may have inhabited online. Yeah, that's right, Ian. Alec Manassian's now infamous Facebook post referring to an incel rebellion is starting to shine a light on a very dark corner of the Internet. As we learn more about a complex subculture of sexually frustrated men who call themselves involuntary celibates, Vicodopia tells us how their frustration can evolve into extremism. I just don't know what it is about me that's so repulsive to others, you know, that they feel the need to insult me and exclude me from everything. Excluded, scorned, and alone. Their frustration festering online in forums like incels.me, 4chan, and Reddit's brain cells, where Alec Manassian has divided self-identified incels, involuntary celibates. Some people are worried that their spaces are going to get shut down. Others are kind of reveling in the attention, and uh, some are pushing for copycat attacks. For years, Arshi Mann has been tracking the angry online subculture he broadly calls the male grievance movement, a place where misogynistic and racist rants find a home among incels, a community that has struggled with relationships with women to the point of giving up, some even calling for retribution, like Elliot Roger. You girls have never been attracted to me. The California man who four years ago left a manifesto and chilling video before going on a killing rampage that ended in his suicide. I think for sure the misogyny has been there for a long time. I think um, this kind of toxic masculinity uh, that feeds off of an entitlement to, to women, to sex, uh, is a big part of that, and that's quite universal. Don't be unattractive. <laughs> this documentary tracks a group of self-described incels who meet online, then try to meet women and fail. The filmmaker agrees in rare cases, the online rage can turn violent. It's sort of this mixture of like self-loathing and, and just frustration and um, I think at that point, maybe they just want to see the world burn a little bit, punishing us for not seeing their pain. Platforms like Reddit have taken action against incel forums, but new ones reappear. We call upon the uh, web giants to make sure that they counter any form of hate speech and any form of discrimination. Given the anonymous nature of incel forums, it's unknown how many active members there are and if Alec Manassian was one of them. But police are investigating the connection. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. The incels are part of a larger online group that's been called the Manosphere. These blogs and forums lament the plight of men, often by heaping blame and scorn on women. Aditi Natasha Kinney is a journalist who's looked into these groups, and she joins me tonight from New York. Um, Aditi, we've been talking about incels a lot, obviously, in, in this country over the past couple of days, but this is a bigger community. What, what do they all have in common? It's a, it's a platform for men's rights. Uh, men's rights activists in general have an issue with feminism, with women's rights, and are often misogynist communities. Ex other examples are the Red Pill, which is a community of people who have taken the Red Pill from the Matrix and believe that pickup artist techniques are the only way to date women. Um, and uh, on Reddit, the Red Pill has a quarter of a million subscribers. There's other ones as well, of course. Okay, so, so it is, it could be a lot of people on these platforms. How do we know whether they are just trolls or people talking or whether they are about to become radicalized, violent people? It's hard to know. Um, it's hard to pinpoint when something turns from violent ideation into action. But part of it is the indoctrination on these communities. When someone is spewing hatred and getting that feedback from peers in these communities, the voices in their head um, start to seem even more real. It's very real to them that their sexual frustration is because of, um, of, uh, of what they call normies, that is, people who have sex, of people, the majority of the mainstream. So it's hard to say when 
uh, that online radicalization can become a real life threat. But with Elliot Roger, you can yeah. see that he definitely um, had an ample time to do that. You yourself have been threatened for just for talking about this. Yes, I have. Um, the Vice article I wrote in November got me a lot of uh, threats, and I was doxxed. What, what have you noticed in the past couple of days on message boards about Alec Manassian? I've noticed a couple of a variety of reactions, actually. The first one I noticed was, like, people being incredulous. They mm -hmm. were... Uh, so they were surprised. They thought that he was not really an incel. They thought that the mainstream was trying to malign incels. The second reaction I saw was people afraid that the becoming mainstream would mean that their communities would be shut down and examined. And the third, which was the concerning one, was, yeah. were people who were excited that he was one of them and that it was now time for revenge and to make people afraid of their sexual frustration. Okay. Aditi and Natasha Kinney, thanks for your perspective tonight. Thank you. Now, we do not know for certain whether misogyny was a factor in the van attack, but one fact about Monday's victims is indisputable and chilling. Looking at the list, the names seem to be predominantly females, at uh, least on uh, Yeah, the... that's fair to say, predominantly female. The idea that women may have been targeted is raising disturbing memories of the Polytechnique massacre nearly 30 years ago. And as was the case then, many women today think a conversation about misogyny needs to be front and center as society searches for an explanation. Renee Filipponi looks at that part of the story. On the surface, life appears to be getting back to normal here. But for the women who live and work on Young Street, Monday's attack weighs on them. I know it's not like confirmed yet what's his motive, but if it was that, I don't get it. Like, I can't really understand why would he do that. I'm not sure uh, any woman would say say no that they weren't concerned about their safety, but um, that just. I mean, this, this situation amplifies everything. Experience violence. Police won't comment on motive, but this women's advocate says even a possibility of a link to misogyny needs to be acknowledged. We're looking away from the issue and wanting to blame the internet, wanting to blame um, mental health, uh, wanting to blame religion, race, etc. But if, what you look, if you look at um, the common factor here, it's often, way too often, a real rage and a misogyny. I think it's early days. I don't Ontario think Premier that. Kathleen Wynne was careful in her comments today, but she did share her thoughts about the online posts. As the first female Premier of Ontario, but as a mom and as a grandmother, is that um, it's very disturbing. But gender-motivated violence existed long before the Internet. Nearly 30 years ago in Montreal, 14 women were killed by an armed man who blamed feminists for his personal failings. Some say the parallels between that attack and the latest one are hard to ignore. Our entire organization was formed in response to a massacre. So uh, these early news reports are extremely concerning to us. Jeff Feiner is the board chair of White Ribbon, a global movement of men working to end violence against women. He says there needs to be a major culture shift. It's challenging traditional views that I would call toxic masculinity. And it's promoting respect, uh, gender equality, and a consent culture. And that's all very important. And there isn't one answer to all of this. But it's that dialogue, uh, among other things, that's, that's important. And while authorities are not ready to answer the question why, it's a conversation advocates say needs to happen now. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Toronto. Here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. Should a Canadian tech company be allowed to sell its content-blocking software to repressive regimes? Also, not something you see every day. How that plane wound up on a busy Calgary street. And after that deadly crash in Saskatchewan, we look at the trucking industry in Canada. Why some say big rig drivers have been sounding the alarm over training. If you guys don't wake up and smell the coffee and realize what's going on around you, it's going to take a major wreck for people to take notice. And I think we just got there.
It's been almost three weeks since a semi-trailer collided with a bus carrying the Humboldt Broncos hockey team. 16 people died. And while we still don't know the cause of the crash, many truckers say it should serve as a wake-up call. For me, it was unbelievable. And it was a black day for the trucking industry. CBC News has heard from several instructors who say every day drivers are getting into their big rigs and hitting Canada's highways without adequate training. They told our Olivia Stefanovic if something doesn't change, more lives could be at stake. So, as a truck driver, I had to watch all the signs. Eugene Prokop makes it look easy, but this is hard work. He wanted to just sneak in, but he saw my maneuver and he slowed down. He has to be careful. Exactly he carries right. 30 tons, a full load. When you do it right, this is actually fun. But you have to be safe. Have you had any close calls? Yes, I did. Prokot says he once avoided a pileup in Chicago by driving into a ditch. He wasn't hurt thanks to experience. But when it comes to drivers, that's, that's the big issue here. The requirements to get a truck driver's license vary across Canada. Ontario is the only province where truck driving training is mandatory. In Saskatchewan and elsewhere, it's optional. And is we need to take the control away from the individual provinces. Reg Lewis lost his parents and three other family members in a head-on collision with a semi nearly 30 years ago. Lewis says the exams are too easy. He says he and other instructors are knowingly sending hundreds of ill-prepared drivers behind the wheel. This is something that has to change. We have to get higher standards. I did this as a reminder. Vince Trombley wears the names of his children on his sleeves, a way to keep in mind that no delivery deadline is worth taking a chance on the road. My end goal is that I get home safely. Transport Canada says it supports the mandatory training of commercial drivers, but those changes lie with the provinces and territories. The Saskatchewan government says it's optimistic training will eventually become mandatory, but so far, there's no time frame. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Weyburn. So the truckers we spoke with say more training could save lives. And if you look at all collisions involving tractor trailers in Saskatchewan over the past decade, dozens of people are killed every year, about 26 on average. Still ahead on The National, a CBC News investigation into the Canadian tech company helping repressive regime censor internet content around the world. Should our government get involved? And much ado about Apu. Why the man who voices the long-running Simpsons character may be ready to hang it up. For the next five minutes, I'm going to party like it's on sale for $19.99. I'm perfectly willing and happy to step aside or help transition it into something new. I really hope that's what The Simpsons does. Tonight on The National, National, word from Donald Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, that he will not testify in the civil case against him, brought by porn star Stormy Daniels. That's his right, and he says it's to avoid possibly incriminating himself, given there's also an ongoing criminal investigation into his business dealings. We are committed, we are determined, and we will, God willing, hold this man fully accountable for his crimes. Police in California say they've caught the man they believe was a serial rapist and killer in the 1970s and 80s. They've charged former police officer Joseph James D'Angelo with two murders. But if he is the so-called Golden State Killer, he's believed to have killed 12 people and raped dozens more. And in Denmark today, a conclusion to a gruesome murder case that's captured the world's attention. The Danish inventor, accused of killing a Swedish journalist, was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Kim Wall disappeared last August after boarding Peter Madsen's submarine for a story she was researching. Prosecutors said Madsen planned the killing and then dismembered her body and discarded the remains. A Canadian tech company is under fire over its web filtering technology, a product it says was intended to protect against the most corrosive corners of the internet. 
But a new report from researchers at Citizen Lab, based at the University of Toronto, says NetSweeper is being used to censor web users in countries where human rights are under attack. Dave Seglins explains. Few would argue against blocking pornography, hate, criminality. It's done in schools, libraries and workplaces across Canada and around the world. The Canadian company NetSweeper has become an international leader, selling internet filtering software around the globe, blocking millions of users from reaching potentially offensive websites. But researchers at the University of Toronto say they've discovered NetSweeper being used to filter web traffic in 30 countries. And they say in at least eight of them, the technology is censoring entire populations, millions of people in violation of their basic human rights. Canada is a country that's defined by its values. This is a Canadian company headquartered here. We should expect more of Canadian companies and the Canadian government, frankly. In Yemen, for example, in the midst of civil war, Citizen Lab says the regime is using NetSweeper to block news and opposition websites. Gay or lesbian websites are blocked in Bahrain and UAE. And in Kuwait, they say, some pages of the World Health Organization are censored. And perhaps more surprising, NetSweeper is also big in India, the world's largest democracy. Journalists with the Indian Express worked with Citizen Lab to see exactly what was being censored. Even sites of, say, human rights groups and NGOs uh, are also blocked or have been blocked, uh, along with some interesting Facebook accounts and Twitter accounts. In a statement, NetSweeper said it is a world leader in Internet safety and challenges the Citizen Lab conclusions. NetSweeper has always and remains fully compliant with Canadian law and in those countries where it has ongoing concerns. And it adds, NetSweeper cannot prevent an end user from manually overriding its software. But critics say if Canadian technology is being misused abroad, Ottawa should step in, like stopping combat helicopters destined for the Philippines or armored vehicles sold to Saudi Arabia. You can see those, they're products, you know, you can, you can visualize the consequence. Um, censorship is unique and, and censorship on the internet is particularly hard to get a hold of and actually see um, when you don't know what's being withheld from you. Ottawa says it's concerned that Canadian-made software may be preventing free access to the Internet abroad. Now, Global Affairs told us in a statement that it's in talks with its international partners on just how it might control this type of technology. Dave Seglin, CBC News, Toronto. Arnella Ayed has also been working with Citizen Lab to examine the use of NetSweeper in countries with troubling human rights records. In particular, its impact on the Arab Spring, when authoritarian governments in the Middle East were eager to crush dissent and silence activists. If you've owned an iPhone in the past two years, then you owe something to the man they call the Million Dollar Dissident. In 2016, someone tried to hack into human rights activist Ahmad Mansour's phone. He shared the suspicious text with Toronto-based Citizen Lab. The lab's diagnosis? Malware, estimated at more than a million dollars, capable of turning an iPhone into a spying tool that can track everything that you do. We did a responsible disclosure after that discovery that led to Apple issuing a security patch that affected more than one billion people worldwide. Shortly afterwards, the man who protected your phone from hacking was thrown into prison. The quest to quiet blogger and activist Ahmed Mansour started in earnest with the upheaval of the so-called Arab Spring. Mansour was already becoming a trusted voice abroad on human rights and at home sometimes the only voice defending them. He'd co-founded a bold online discussion forum that quickly found an audience. By 2010, says Citizen Lab, Canadian company NetSweeper had provided the technology to help one of the country's main internet providers sweep the web of unwanted content. Well, Mohammed uh, Mansour.
Khaled Ibrahim is executive director of the Gulf Center for Human Rights. The famous blogger, famous for his uh, efforts to promote uh, human rights, to promote uh, freedom of expression and freedom of uh, opinion. In the affluent, Western-friendly, but politically autocratic United Arab Emirates, the demand for change took the form of a petition. Mansour and dozens of other Emiratis signed to demand an elected parliament. The authorities moved swiftly to shut it all down. And it is here Mansour's gradual muzzling begins. His discussion forum blocked, according to Citizen Lab, with the help of NetSweeper filtering. And for Mansour, that changed everything. I always wanted to see change. I believed a lot in equality. But I was not engaged in direct activities myself until the government decided to nail down the most critical discussion forum. One morning, Mansour was arrested, manages to note it on his personal blog. In prison for eight months, then convicted of threatening state security and insulting the country's leadership. He was pardoned, but the forum was dead. Gulf specialist Christopher Davidson wrote then the Emirates had lost its only credible online forum. It's essentially remove that bit of breathing space, that bit of wiggle room, if you like, uh, that citizens now really don't have. And they either have to toe the authorities' line, come what may, or be an outright dissenter who risks being arrested. There's no middle ground anymore. It seems there was no limit to the lengths authorities would go to try to muzzle human rights activist Ahmed Mansour. The security authorities in the country started to campaign, trying to tarnish me and fabricate videos and stories about me. I received several death threats from individuals who gave their phone numbers and their full names. But he wouldn't budge. Others landed in prison, self-censored, or left. Mohammed al sakr is a former Emirati prosecutor who says he was forced to retire early for his views, and so he moved to London. Online, too, the drive to choke dissent picked up speed. Mansour was already on it, trying to document the clampdown. Then once again, it hit close to home. His personal blog also blocked, again, according to Citizen Lab, with the help of NetSweeper's filtering technology. A third site connected to Mansour belongs to the Gulf Center for Human Rights. Mansour is on their board. What if I told you that your website is blocked in the UAE using Canadian technology? Uh, I, I really, I am unhappy about that kind of support, technical support to governments that, uh, that are abusing human rights on a daily basis. This, this should be stopped immediately. Ron Debert and his team at Toronto's Citizen Lab have tracked NetSweeper for years in the UAE. It's a country that uh, has a long track record of human rights violations. So it's not surprising that they do that. What's surprising to me, and what is really, frankly, unacceptable, is that a Canadian company is effectively servicing that type of censorship. NetSweeper disagrees with Citizen Lab's findings, says its technology is content neutral, that it can't prevent clients from manually overriding its software. Global Affairs says Canada is concerned by what it called allegations of misuse of Canadian technology. al sakar the former prosecutor, expects better. Yani, 
ساهم في تكميم افواه الشعوب المضطهده ايضا International rights groups say the Emirates, an ally of the West, has an ever-worsening record of violations. Amnesty International calls Mansour's record as a determined lone critic unimpeachable. Ahmed Mansour, do you hear me? Yes, well, very yes, welcome I to can. you. Deserving of the 2015 Martin Annals Award, the Nobel Prize for Human Rights. It is through a video made by that foundation then that we've been able to hear Mansour's voice now. Even removing one stone from this mountain is better than just keeping the mountain as is. Mansour was banned from travel, so it was al sakr who accepted it. Last year, Mansour was arrested. Authorities say for publishing false information, damaging the country's reputation, spreading hatred and sectarianism. The million dollar dissident silencing was complete. In the Gulf countries, um, you have many, many cases like what has happened to Ahmad Mansour in the UAE. People who speak out against the government or advocate for free speech or human rights can end up in prison. And, and that's why uh, this is a, a, a really important case study, I think, to, to put to the test. Do we really care about these principles here in Canada? As they have outside the UAE, inside others have taken up Mansour's cause, carefully and quietly. And there are new ways to access blocked content online. Mansour, however, is still behind bars. Nala Ayed, CBC News, London. And a reminder, you can go deeper on the stories of the day earlier in the day by subscribing to our newsletter, cbcnews.ca slash The National. The National Today takes you inside our journalism every afternoon. This is something you don't see every day. A plane smack dab in the middle of a normally busy Calgary street. Tonight, officials are investigating why the pilot of that small plane made that incredible emergency landing there on the road instead of touching down at the Calgary airport just minutes away. Our Carolyn Dunn heard from some very surprised residents at the scene. Watch closely on the top right-hand corner of your screen. That's security video of a small plane about to land exactly where it shouldn't, in the middle of a three-lane city street, minutes before it would have been filling up with commuter traffic. And I heard this loud noise and looked up and it come right over my head. It looked like it was approaching these businesses here, but it, it veered off just enough. It all happened early this morning, just as the sun was rising. This Piper Navajo was inbound to Calgary International Airport when something went terribly wrong. It was coming in kind of an angle and clipped that light post. I'm just glad everyone's safe. And the pilot did a heck of a job to get her down like that. So, Much to the amazement of hundreds who snapped photos of the spectacle from the ground and from a passing light rail train. So why did this plane change its path and instead land on a busy commuter road with a car dealership and LRT on one side and a populated neighbourhood on the other? The pilot's communications with air traffic control may hold a clue. Bad arrival to Charlie Whiskey Whiskey. I've just lost uh, right fuel pump. That's why we requested 35 right. Of course, the plane never made it to that alternate airport runway about five kilometres away. Yeah, she came down from that end south way. Instead, it landed just meters from the home Jamal Hamoud shares with his wife and two young sons. Lots of going through your head when you see an airplane right in front of your house. You're thinking about the damage that could have been done. You think about how many people could have been hurt, right? You think about your family, your house. Remarkably, no one on board was hurt. Not the four passengers, not the two crew, though witnesses say they seemed shaken by their close call. Now the Transportation Safety Board is on scene in the rare position of documenting and investigating a small plane emergency in the middle of a city road. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. For months, Saskatchewan threatened a legal fight against the federal government's national carbon pricing scheme. Today, it announced it's taking Ottawa to court. 
Saskatchewan should not be subject to this tax simply because the Trudeau Liberals do not like our climate change plan. Overwhelmingly, Saskatchewan people do not support the Trudeau carbon tax. The province is asking the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal to decide whether it's unconstitutional for Ottawa to impose a carbon tax on provinces and territories, something Saskatchewan has vigorously opposed. It says Ottawa's national plan infringes on provincial jurisdiction. Federal government obviously disagrees. An uproar at the University of Alberta is spreading across the province, triggered by a decision to award David Suzuki an honorary doctorate in June. Oil sand supporters are furious and flooding the school with complaints. As Rafi Bujakanian tells us now, the university isn't backing down, at least not yet. David Suzuki is known as a champion for the environment, but part of that includes raising the alarm on Alberta's oil industry. Are the oil sands being developed too rapidly? What are the implications for climate change? That doesn't sit well with some in the energy sector and its defenders. Now as the University of Alberta gears up to award Suzuki with an honorary degree, this law firm is pulling $300,000 in planned donations. We're under no obligation to fund that university through our donations. There are internal grumblings too, open letters from two different faculties. The Dean of Engineering calls the degree a direct and alarming threat and the worst crisis, a crisis of trust that we've faced in more than three decades. The official opposition tweeted out a link to a petition asking the university to reverse its decision. David Suzuki, who has said that uh, the oil sands are the moral equivalent to, quotes, slavery. Uh, I'm not a big fan of this decision. And if the university thought it would get support from Alberta's NDP government, it was in for a surprise. Our government has worked very hard over the last three years to move away from this divisive approach to addressing environmental progress and economic sustainability. The David Suzuki Foundation says the outcry is a distraction. We're trying to discredit uh, the, the messenger and the science uh, when the science is clear and then we rely on, on the economic factors. So we have to really overcome this and we have to ensure that, that our universities remain open spaces for dialogue and discussion. The university is standing by its decision to honour Suzuki, but he could have more obstacles in his way. Hundreds of people have shown an interest in attending an anti-Suzuki rally in June. Suzuki already has 29 honorary degrees, including one from this province. The University of Calgary recognised them in 1986. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. And we have more on the growing controversy over another famous figure, this one entirely fictional. The Simpsons' lovable Quickie Mart owner, Apu, has for decades been played by a white actor, Hank Azaria. But that could change. For the next five minutes, I'm going to party like it's on sale for 19.99. Apu is a fan favorite, but resistance to the way he's portrayed has been building for years, and it hit an angry pitch after a recent documentary by an Indian American comic. I should be completely happy, but there's still one man who haunts me: Apu Nahasapima Petalon. The Simpsons tried to address the controversy in a recent episode with Marge and Lisa talking about how values change over time, but it was criticized as vague, if not a total cop-out. Then last night, on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, the voice of Apu said this. I really want to see Indian, South Asian writer, writers in the room, not in a token way, but genuinely informing whatever new direction this character may take, including how it is voiced or not voiced. You know, I, I'm perfectly willing and happy to step aside or help transition it into something new. I really hope that's what The Simpsons does. You see, the makers of The Simpsons haven't yet commented officially. There's no structure I have been to. Tonight on The National, new charges against a teenager who was shot in the head during an altercation at a Quebec courthouse. In January, the 18-year-old allegedly took a constable's baton and started hitting him with it. The constable in turn shot him. Now, the teen faces four charges, including assault with a weapon. 
His mother, upset about the charges, told Radio Canada that her son is dealing with memory loss, some paralysis, and partial deafness. We have an update tonight on former U.S. President George H.W. Bush. Three days after being hospitalized with an infection, a family spokesperson says he's out of the ICU, recovering well, and apparently in good spirits. Have a look. Part of a statement read, as he feels good now, he is more focused on the Houston Rockets, closing out their playoff series against the Minnesota Timberwolves than anything that landed him in hospital. You see, sports can be a bit of a distraction, and I know not all of you are fans of the sports teams here in Toronto, but, but something very unusual happened in the city tonight. Four of the city's major league teams were in action. The Jays are early in their season, but the Leafs, Raptors, and Soccer's TFC are in playoff games. And so we asked fans gathering outside in the rain what it's like to cheer for Toronto. And that is our moment of the day. Tonight's a historic night, going to be a historic night because all of our teams are going to take it home. Let's go Raptors! Go Leafs! Go! What does it mean to be a Toronto sports fan? Oh, it means the world, especially on a day like today where we got all five teams playing. It's just great. It's just such a community here. It's, it, it's a great place to be right now. It's just, it's so fun to be here. Everybody's having such a good time. How badly do Torontonians need this, Sophia? I think a lot, especially not just because of sports history, but everything that's going on right now, I think it would bring up the spirits of the city by a lot. In midst of what's happening on the streets, we're still together. We're not scared to come out and stand out. What, why is it raining? I don't know, but we're all still here to support the Leafs and the Raptors and the Jays and the TFC. And the fifth team, if you're wondering, is the, the AHL uh, hockey team. Uh, but anyway, you know, distraction, uh, obsession, I don't know, a lot of people. Uh, Rosie, uh, enjoying being a sports fan tonight here in the city. I am uh, not a big sports fan, as you know. I, I am know. a big Drake fan, <laughs> so he's at, the, he's at the Raptors game. That's good. And I will cheer on the hometown Winnipeg Jets before any of those other teams. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, allow me just to add, Ian, that, that as the only one of us three who, who actually is physically in Toronto right now, all we can do is, is live vicariously through you. So soak it up. For us. That's a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> That's the National for Wednesday, April 25th. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.